As we get started, or, or in, in order to get started, I want you to think for a moment, imagine some tumbleweeds blowing across the stage. Imagine that whistling if you've seen the, the Good, the Bad, the Ugly, Sergio Leone's epic movie. That movie about those three gunslingers that, are, that are shi form some shifting, uneasy alliances as they're off trying to find uh, some stolen gold. There's a great quote from Blondie, uh, that's the good one, Clint Eastwood, who says, $200,000 is a lot of money, we're going to have to earn it. If you've ever participated in a bug bounty program, $200,000 is a lot of money, you also have to earn it. If you've ever run a bug bounty program, $200,000 is a lot of money to spend. So you also want to make sure you spend it wisely. And that's a little bit of what this presentation is about. How do we spend our time and our money wisely? And how do we manage that throughout different types of crowdsourced security models? Because one of the ways we can manage is Clint Eastwood's way. You see, in this world, there's two kinds of people, my friend. Those with loaded guns and those who dig. You dig. Now, as a management uh, a technique, this can be very effective, but it's not very collaborative. And in the long run, it's not necessarily the best way we want to engage people identifying vulns with us. Nor, from that perspective, is it the way we want to be extorted. Because a little bit later in this movie, Lee Van Cleef shows up, gets the drop on both Blondie and Tuco, and says, two people can dig better than one. So we want to avoid whoever has the biggest gun in our management techniques here. But, and as we're thinking about this, my other favorite quote is from Tuco. He's unfortunately the ugly one. But he says, there are two kinds of spurs, my friend. Those that come in by the door, those that come in by the window. What this is a little bit more about are vulnerabilities. All applications have vulns. Those vulns are going to be discovered by someone. Hopefully, they'll be discovered and reported to us in a responsible, well, not responsible necessarily, the better term is in a coordinated manner or in a collaborative manner, rather than it's going to be exploited or extorted. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the ransomware, for example, this morning. Exploiting a well-known vuln or a vuln that had been patched, but something that came in by the window and even locked us out of our own systems, locked the windows behind us, and we couldn't access our data. So keep these in mind as we start to dive into other concepts of these hordes and crowds. Now, I've been talking about twos. Two, another way of thinking about this in crowdsource security, um, we have collective nouns for things. We have swarms of insects. We have murders of crows, a parliament of ravens. I also like to describe a cacophony of hordes or a scrutiny of crowds. Another way to think of this, if you're a Duran Duran fan, Hungry Like the Wolf, you can uh, straddle the line between discord and rhyme. We don't want to have a horde that's just reporting a lot of noise and giving us a lot of vulns that we don't care about or have actually no risk associated with them. We want to find some sort of crowd that we're willing to compensate, but that's also going to give us some high quality reports and something informative about the web applications or the applications that we own. So now we need to focus a little bit more concisely onto some very direct, simple questions. How do we spend our time wise, or how do we spend our time efficiently on finding vulns, vuln discovery? How do we allocate our budgets in a really in, in the best way possible, or in a wise way? And are we doing this in a manner that's actually reducing risk? Are we making an impact? Or are we just doing something where we fritter away our time in an offhand way? So when we talk about metrics or when we're trying to answer these questions, we want to pull out some metrics. Metrics are numbers. And one of the easiest, best numbers we can get when we're talking about bug bounties is the actual value or the price of the payout for a bug bounty. Now, bug bounties themselves, they may vary a little bit from organization to organization. Here's one that I was involved with where the range of payouts were anywhere from $0 or a t-shirt all the way up to $15,000. Now, sometimes those ranges might be 0 to 10K or 0 to 5K. But regardless of what that window is or what that wide range is of payouts, what tends to happen is that the average payout is actually very um, to, the, to the low end. In this case, it was around $800. And if you look at other public bug bounty programs, the average payouts tend to be right around that $800 to $1,000 range. 
But within that range, there's also lots of variance, of course. So you don't, it's not that you pay for the OWASP top 10 category. You pay for the risk associated with that particular vulnerability. So a cross-site scripting might be $50 if it's just one of those, for example, just the, the cockroaches of the internet and it doesn't have any real impact or it doesn't really expose any data or compromise any user. Or it could be a $10,000 cross-site scripting if it's something that is trivially delivered to the victim, it can compromise their email store, and it can exfiltrate data without them having to be social engineered or without them even having to interact with a web application in any unnatural way. So that's just an idea of what one of the metrics now that we have around risk and the idea of putting money around the risk. But one of the other things to think about is that bounties are a bit of an imperfect proxy when we talk about work. When we start to examine bounty programs or we start to examine who is making the most reports or who is earning the most money, it tends to be the case that some small X percent of those researchers are contributing 50% or earning 50% of those bounty payouts. And it may be something a little less small, but still a relatively small number that's actually earning 80% of that money. And what we'll do throughout the next couple of slides is try to figure out what that X and Y percentage is and how we might react to it and, what, and, and um, how we'll manage around that. So speaking of bug bounties, um, here is an example of the noise. So this is the idea of that cacophony within the, a bug bounty program. On the right, uh, your right-hand side, 33% of, on average, were of reports that come in were actually valid. So this means of all the reports coming in, only one-third of them actually turned into valid bugs that needed to be fixed for a bug bounty program. This is, this is unlike a pen test, which might be around 90 to, uh, ideally, 100% of the findings. And some of the reason is that when you engage a pen tester, for example, you're engaging someone who is doing all the triage and saying these are valid, impactful results, go fix them, versus a bug bounty, which is a bit noisy. You might have items that, you might not be able to read the, the, the bottom here, but you have a column of out of scope reports, reports that aren't even associated with the particular app that you own. They might even be a different organization. They might be invalid for some reason, invalid meaning we don't care about not having the X-Frame option set, or we don't really think that there's that much impact around the cookie flags, or something like that that's not necessarily exploitable or doesn't have a security impact, even though the researcher says, I could take down your systems based on this, a little bit of hyperbole. This far left column, however, is duplicates. Duplicates are just a source of noise because Lots of people might be able to find the same cross-site scripting vuln, the same SQL injection vuln, the same CSRF, et cetera, et cetera. But one of the things that I like to highlight when we're talking about duplicates is duplicates are a matter of, uh, of practice. They happen within bounty programs, but they're not necessarily a fault of bug bounty programs. Because if you have a web application and you've said, we need to have some type of security for it, let's turn on a bounty program suddenly you'll get a deluge of reports. If you're not prepared to be able to fix them within even one day, let alone seven days, but if it's taking 30 days or 60 days or 90 days to fix these vulnerabilities, that's a large window of opportunity where more and more people are going to report these types of vulns and build that noise, build those duplicates within your program. And those duplicates are, they, they cost time just to be able to say, yep, I've seen this before, need to mark it off. From the researcher's perspective, it's also kind of you're, you're losing a little bit of goodwill with them because if I'm a researcher and I go in, spend a few hours, identify a vulnerability, submit it, only to be responded to with, thanks for, thanks for playing, but we've already found this, there's no payment, that's my time or that's the researcher's time that's now not compensated. So handling those duplicates or, or keeping those duplicates small is something that you, if you're managing the program and managing the app, more importantly, can actually have an impact on. And that really speaks to how mature is your SDLC program, how quickly can you actually fix vulnerabilities. So this brings us to our first, not necessarily earth-shattering insight based on the data we've got, but 
Noise increases cost of discovery. It reduces the efficiency of vulnerability discovery. Now, I say it's not too earth shattering because we might have guessed it, but one of the things that I want to emphasize is that we're collecting data, or we're collecting metrics about a program in order to call out things that we care about. In other words, we have budget that we're spending, and we have now, we're, we are increasing the cost. We're spending more than we budgeted for, and we're losing time. We're losing efficiency in time. So time and money are two important things. There are, of course, some things that we can do to try and manage this. I like to call out just the, the top and the bottom. Simple documentation as well as documentation that's going to change over time. Keep a change log for it. Drop it in a GitHub, put it on a wiki. But also the very bottom is work under reasonable threat models. There's a lot of noise that comes in through bug bounty programs because people will say, I found this bug, or theoretically, or oftentimes you'll also see comments that, set, that start off with something like, if the same origin policy were broken, or if I were able to execute a script on your website, then I could do this. Or, you know, if the planets were aligned, then this could happen. These are a lot more theoretical, a lot less realistic, and they cause a lot, of, they, they add just to a lot of noise into those, those programs. So that's why there's the idea of focus on a realistic threat model. What do you really care about within this app? What's the nature of the data in there? Now, as I continue on to the next few slides, I'm going to be making some comparisons between bug bounties and pen testing. And the idea here is not to place one as better or worse than the other. It's more to give us some different ways of looking at this problem and different ways that we might want to spend our time and spend our security budgets on the idea of vulnerability discovery. So before we get into those comparisons, I wanted to pull up just a list of data that I had available looking at the OWASP top 10 and what tended to be reported between bug bounty and, and uh, pen test programs. So three things really stand out. At the very top, pen tests tend to report a lot more uh, vulnerabilities related to authentication and session handling. This perhaps isn't too surprising because the nature of pen testing typically is, here are some credentials, please go find all the vulnerabilities within it. And these are credentials that, aren't, that are for applications that don't necessarily have self-registration or easy free registration where random bug bounty researchers might be able to do that. So that might explain why pen tests report more of those. On the other hand, down here, we have sensitive data exposure and misconfigurations that bug bounty tend to report those in more categories. Sensitive data exposure is possibly explained by the fact that it's a great bang for the buck. Uh, ideally, every application out there does care about user data and privacy. So anything that's like a sensitive data exposure tends to be higher risk, therefore tends to be a higher payout. From the researcher's perspective, they can also be pretty easy to discover and reproduce and explain. So it can be a low effort, uh, low effort of finding for a high payout. So that's a really good type of hourly rate, if you will. Uh, misconfigurations is another big one, but to me, misconfigurations, that's, that's, the, that's the most reported in both of these pen tests and, and uh, bug bounties. But let's step back for a second and say, why is misconfiguration so prevalent? If we were to throw scanners into this mix, scanners like a web app scanner or a code scanner or even a, like a simple linter or a configuration checker, those are the types of things that I would think are, ex, would excel at identifying security misconfigurations. So one of the questions here, if we were to, to dive into this data some more and be able to go and do some interviews of all the diff these different organizations would be to say, did you even run a scanner in the first place before you started this program, whether it was a bug bounty or engage on a pen test? Because if you didn't, and these scanners can find those trivial misconfigurations, you might be overpaying for those types of vulnerabilities. You could write a you know, 10 line Python script or go get a simple fixed price scanner to identify a bunch of these rather than pay a consultant hourly rate or be paying $800 per misconfiguration. So just some things to think about when we talk about the nature of the vulnerabilities that are identified. And they tend to be pretty close, they tend to track pretty closely with each other, whether it is a pen test or a bug bounty. So now, let's dive into some more data, some more metrics. So I am a big Doctor Who fan, so I like to talk about time. 
So here is an exploration of vulnerabilities within bug bounties and pen tests with the total number of findings within each engagement. And at the bottom, we have the, the days on a log scale between the first and last finding. So what we're looking at is how long did it take to find, quote unquote, all of the vulns or, the, or report the vulns that were found for an engagement. And what we see is that whether it's a pen test or a bug bounty, the number is pretty much the same. And I, what this really boils down to is that a pen test will take about two weeks maybe to find those vulnerabilities, where a bug bounty may take two weeks, two months, or a full year to get to that same number. So this isn't necessarily good or bad, but one way to react to it is to say, how will this align with a, my release cycles? For example, what if I'm, if I'm on a, a two-week sprint and I have small features coming out time after time, you might not be able to do two-week development, two-week pen test, two-week development, two-week pen test. Maybe you need that ongoing scrutiny of a bug bounty. On the other hand, if you have six-week release cycles, maybe it is good to know that after that release cycle, you do that really quick, concise pen test to find out how bad is this? Did we introduce any vulnerabilities? Should we, is there something that we need to fix? So it's the idea here is about the timing and track when are the vulnerabilities coming in and how can you align that with a development strategy? Because ideally we do actually want to fix all the vulns rather than just know that they exist. So that was time. Now we'll, add, we'll take that time of looking at bug bounties and add some money on top of it. So how much are we actually spending on our bug bounty program? How much are we paying out to all the researchers that are identifying these, these vulns? So again, we have on the bottom, we have the number of days, and that once again is just a logarithmic scale. And we have an expenditure. What's our total payout for, for these bug bounties? And what I've done is just said, there's gonna be some point where there's a line for fixed price pen tests. So that's, that's, one, that's one ceiling we have. And we'll say maybe in terms of efficiency, a pen test might be two weeks. So there will be a point during which a, a bug bounty is actually going to be more cost effective and just as efficient as doing a penetration test. That's our lower left-hand corner. And in fact, of the data I was looking at over three years, about 40% of the bounty programs probably fell into that either as good as, if not better, than a pen test. Um, about 30% of them said, we're still cost effective because we're not overpaying for our vulns or we're not actually paying more than we would have for a traditional type of pen test. It's just taking us longer to find out how many vulns we have. So rather than waiting two weeks, we've had to wait perhaps 90 days in order to, to know that these are all the vulns within this particular web application. But the important thing that, to call out here is tracking it and to say, at what point do we actually cross that threshold and we are actually spending much more on, on bugs and much more on paying bounties than we should have just engaged someone to say, here's a fixed price, you know, here's $10,000, go do a pen test on our web application rather than paying $10,000 for a single remote command exe uh, ex exploit against our application. And at that point then you can just see over time it becomes a lot really inefficient to track these type or to, um, to have these come in. So the idea is not so much um, that a bounty is good or bad, it's identifying at what point does the bounty cross that threshold where you should probably step back and reevaluate and say maybe I should spend some of this money on a scanner or, or on a different type of vulnerability discovery strategy. Another thing uh, that's interesting, stepping back to time, and talking about bug bounties is how active they tend to be. So in the last two slides, I was talking about bug bounty reports that would come in throughout the year. And often bug bounties run continuously. They run annually, year over year. Google, Facebook, uh, Yahoo, Twitter, you know, Apple, big companies run multi-million dollar programs year after year because they're massive organizations with a massive presence of all kinds of different applications. However, other types of organizations don't necessarily have the street cred, if you will, to say that I was able to hack this particular B2B application or this other application. Yet they still will have a bounty program. What's interesting is that 
looking at the number of reports that come in for that program, on 50% of the time, or 50% of those reports, have roughly four days in between them, between valid reports. So if we're trying to model this or build up sort of a predictive model, we can imagine and say, we'll probably get two reports per week. And if we also step back and say two reports per week, let's imagine $800 on average per report, that's roughly going to be $80,000 for our bug bounty budget. So if we just pause right there and said, we're going to give random people on the internet $80,000 because of coding mistakes in our application, how comfortable are we with that? Or, how, or what does that imply for how risky our web application is? Maybe if we're dealing with PCI data and the types of fines that can come from cardholder exposure and you know, not being able to handle credit card information, if our, you know, if our, um, uh, if, if our uh, certification is revoked, $80,000 might be a great thing. We'll pay that over throughout a year just to make sure there's no vulns out there and we can get them fixed. On the other hand, maybe that's too much. Maybe, maybe we, we should say we're actually collecting uh, or we're handling a lot of data or the type of data that's worth a lot more than $80,000. So maybe our budget should be double that or something like that. So this is why I'm trying to highlight way, what the type of data to collect as well as explain that when we have that data, we can build some models, we can be predictive about it. And some other things that we can do returning to our graph here, is to say what happens after 20 days when 95% of all the vulnerabilities had about 20 days or less in between a report. Let's say it's been 21 days, or it's been 30 days, or it's been 60 days, and we haven't had a valid vulnerability come in for our application. There's a couple ways we can react to this. One, we might be really optimistic and say, fantastic, all of the vulns have been found. Now, that might be a valid statement if you're talking about a legacy system. In other words, a system that's not really changing very much throughout, uh, over time. Maybe the, that, that, when that fall off point means that all of the easy or all of the obvious vulnerabilities actually have been identified. On the other hand, if it's been 30 days since a valid report and you have a monthly release cycle or here's an application that's continuously changing, that possibly means the, the bug bounty crowd or the bug bounty horde has lost interest. And now it's time to kind of re, to, to figure out how do we reinvigorate that interest. Maybe it's something where we'll say, we'll double all of the, the bounties. So we'll pay twice as much now. and Maybe that will attract them back. And if we can also pay twice as much, maybe that also, hopefully, conveys that we have more confidence in the controls and the security that we've built into our web application. Maybe it's also a point to say, it's been a long time since anyone's looked at this. Maybe we should run some more scanners, or maybe we should engage a pen test because we just released a major feature. So it's another way to say, what's the time look like and how, are, how, how much are people paying attention to this pro, uh, bounty program? And I mentioned before, too, this is just another example of the idea of building those models. So the previous model I was describing was the idea that we'll maybe spend $80,000 on our bounty program, just based on napkin math. Obviously, it can vary quite greatly based on the nature of the application, the maturity of the SDLC behind it, whether it's active development or not. But one of the other things we can do is that if we also can go back and think about the noise of a bounty program, how many invalid or duplicate or out of scope reports came in, there's a lot of triage time in there. And we don't necessarily have to triage ourselves. We can pay someone else to do it. We can offload it onto the platform. But there's going to be a cost associated with that. And depending on what we define as our hourly rates, we can, we can and let's say that we're spending uh, $10,000 on the overhead for our program. If we can reduce the, or increase the signal from 20%, meaning uh, one in five vulnerabilities is accurate, up to 80%, so that four out of five vulnerabilities are now valid, we can actually save like around $1,500 just because we don't need to triage that many extra reports. There's not that much distraction in that. That $1,500 could go into attendance at a security conference. That $1,500 could go into developer training so that we can actually embed more security knowledge within the DevOps team, within the developers, and be much more proactive or, or longer thinking 
about improving security. So just another idea of what we can do about building models and having data available to us. I threw this in as a placeholder because one of the other things I wanted to also highlight when we're talking about cost effectiveness and cost is that we shouldn't ignore scanners. If we were to throw scanners on here, I would imagine they would be down here on the lower left hand side because a scanner can run 24 seven. It still requires some configuration, some tuning, a little bit of triage because they're not perfect. They may have some false positives that come in, but they can be very effective. They can be efficient. One of the things, you know, to put an asterisk over, over by it is that they also unfortunately have a ceiling in the type of vulnerabilities that they can find. So if we go back to that OWASP top 10, they may be very good at finding misconfigurations at certain types of cross-site scripting and certain types of SQL injection, but you still need manual analysis to dive into complex authentication and authorization problems, privilege escalation, or items that need um, to interact with really complex workflows. Think of a checkout process, or think of di really dynamic and complex applications that are difficult to crawl. So up to this point, we've been focusing on the time and money that we're investing into vulnerability discovery, saying here's the time and money we've put into a bug bounty, time and money we've put into a penetration test, perhaps time and money we're spending on scanners. But we shouldn't ignore who the people are when we're talking about the, the crowd. We talk about you know, crowdsource security, the wisdom of crowds, turning to the internet, turning to bug bounty and saying, dear random people, please attack my application. Let's actually take a look at how effective that crowd is and how, much, how big of a crowd do you really need in order to get wisdom. So here's some data looking at three years of bug bounty programs. And 5% of the reporters, of the researchers who participated, contributed 50% of all of the reports in that program. So that means if we had, you know, if we had 100 people participating, five of them contributed half of all the vulnerabilities. And 17% of them contributed 80% of the vulnerabilities, all the way to about 52% of them are responsible for 95% of the total reports in the program. So there's some of the, the, the subtext here is to say, you don't necessarily need to grow and grow and grow and have a greater crowd that's attracted into your bounty program or that's attracted to be testing your web application. Because it might be the case that for every 20 people you're adding, only one of them is actually really contributing the majority of the findings. So maybe what, what would be smart to do is to say, who are these 5%? Who's this small cohort of researchers? And if this is a number like 10 people, 20 people, 30 people, that's the group of people that you can go back to and say, you know what? My bounty program has gone stale. It's been a month. I haven't received any vulnerabilities. I'd like to engage you, and I'll pay you, the smaller group, double bounties. Or you know what, we have a feature here that we don't know if it's been tested really well. We're going to give you $500 each just to look at it, whether you find something or not. In other words, sort of a hybrid type of pen test. And what you're doing then at that point is saying, we've identified some people who are skilled. Clearly, they're reporting a lot of items, so they're going to find things. And if they don't find something but they've examined it, that's also good confidence because maybe they can give us that positive feedback about our security that says, in fact, there's no vulnerabilities that we can find, but we did look. And that's a little bit different from the ad hoc sporadic nature of a bug bounty program that's just more about a one hit wonder or here's a vuln, here's a vuln, but you don't necessarily know what's been tested. Now, I have been comparing bug bounties and pen tests. So if we look at, this was bug bounty data. Here is pen test data, and it's pretty close. It's relatively similar. In this case, 12% of the pen testers were responsible for half of the vulnerabilities found, and a full two thirds, 67%, were responsible for 95% of the vulnerabilities found. So you have a little bit of higher participation or a little bit of um, a broader distribution of who's finding things. And this maybe you could explain by saying that pen testers have. Um, more consistent skill, more consistent experience in the types of vulnerabilities they're looking for. And the other thing you could say is that 
They're also going through methodologies. So they're going, rather than just saying, I want to find a cross-site scripting or I want to find that sensitive data exposure that's going to get me a lot of money, I'm going to focus on this particular type of vuln, see if it exists, then go to the next one, then go to the next one, go to the next one. So what a pen test is going to do is just give you confidence in that feedback that says vuln wasn't found, but it was actually tested for. And I'd like to summarize this up because we're still, we have people always looking at this. And if you're familiar with the, the other, other laws out there, this is the, the, the sort of law I like to quote. It says, we always have bugs, eyes are shallow. Meaning developers make mistakes, security people make mistakes, and bug bounty programs have seemed to have arisen out of a need for more scrutiny of web applications or more scrutiny of mobile applications. But one of the things I'm curious about is, have we forgotten about automation? Have we forgotten scanning? Or is scanning perhaps ineffective? It's not, effect it's not keeping pace with the type of complex web applications that we're building. Because clearly, we need people to be able to close this gap between scanners. It's not like everybody has an open source scanner and they're scanning GitHub for things. And I like to summarize this as sort of a bug ops model versus a dev ops model, meaning, just saying that we have a bug bounty program and we're going to put this on top of our web application as a security program isn't a smart strategy. That means we're just going to wait for vulnerabilities to come out into production, fix them as they come, and then move on. What we really should be aiming towards is a risk reduction, meaning taking those vulnerabilities and saying, why did this occur? Is this because of what kind of failure in the, in the development process? Was there a test for it? Could there have been a test for it? Great, let's add a test for it, if not. Was this out of developer ignorance? The, does it actually go back to the classic case of developers need to know what SQL injection is, what prepared statements are? Does it go back to something like we're using a React front end that should have made it very, very difficult to create a cross-site scripting vulnerability, but someone is using the set dangerously HTML function call within React? which in and of itself already says, you know, it's already implying that you shouldn't be using this function, but maybe it's been there. And that's something that we could tackle with linting, or we can tackle with things like uh, git commit hooks, or saying that you shouldn't be using these particular types of functions. So another example to try to help illustrate this is talking about HTTPS. For at least two decades, maybe three decades, the InfoSec community has been saying, come on, use HTTPS, use HTTPS, please use HTTPS. Or they'll try to shame them and say, you're not using HTTPS. And there's been every year at a DEF CON, at a Black Hat, here's how you can do an intermediation, here's how you can intercept people's traffic at a coffee shop, et cetera, et cetera. But what I think really caused a positive change or con contribution was the Let's Encrypt effort. What Let's Encrypt did was rather than say, either shame people and saying, you're not using HTTPS, you're, putting it, you're exposing everybody's privacy, or just asking nicely, please use HTTPS. They said, we understand what your problem is. There's at least two. There's the initial cost of getting a certificate, and there's the ongoing maintenance of it. And so rather than just ramble and say, we, you know, go fix this, go fix this, they took a risk reduction mentality and said, we'll now make it free to obtain a certificate, and using the ACME protocol and using the open source tools that we have available will also make it easier to manage certificates on an ongoing basis. So rather than just say, use HTTPS, use HTTPS, they said, what's the real problem? Why, is, why aren't people using HTTPS? And they went and tackled at least two of those solutions, that initial, pro, that initial cost and ongoing maintenance. So if we return again to the idea of looking at our applications, um, codifying the risk with them. If we were to say, here's tracking pen test data, but we could do the same thing with bug bounty data, we could chart, what are the number of findings associated with our web application or with the, with the target app we had, and what's the average risk of those? We would start to see quadrants, and we're just looking at these relative to each other. The risk here is a simple calculation of impact times likelihood. It could be CVSS scores, it could be sad faces, happy faces. The point is, it just needs to be consistent within what you're tracking and how you're tracking them. So set up what the risk looks like for all the apps that you're tracking, and then say, we want some strategies. 
And our strategies are going to be things like increasing a number or decreasing a number, or we want to target a particular vulnerability class. We want to do something that says SQL injection should no longer exist, so we're going to go and review and make sure we're using prepared statements. Or we're using, we're going to deploy content security policy to help us mitigate a lot of cross-site scripting. But the point is, we'll have some type of strategy that we can measure, and we're going to track as a goal, and we're going to see what happens on our risk matrix. I took, I like to talk about vulnerabilities in this case, um, kind of like a disease model. Think of it like the Centers for Disease Control. They talk about diseases in terms of sporadic and pandemic, epidemic, and so on. An epi or a pandemic application is, uh, is some application that has lots of findings and all of them are high risk. So there's at least two things here. One, with lots of findings, there's going to be a lot of effort just to fix them all. So already there's a lot of developer time invested in it. But when they're so high risk, that also implies that maybe there is a, some type of design problem here or some type of architectural problem. And once again, that implies a lot of necessity for looking for developer time to go revisit and say, how did this get built this way? What do we need to do to fundamentally change how we're using libraries? How are you calling to the back end? How are you using our APIs? And the goal should be, as we monitor those strategies, increasing numbers, decreasing numbers, we're moving into that lower left-hand sporadic quadrant so that we say, yes, vulnerabilities are going to happen because people do make mistakes. Try to write a two-paragraph email without making a typo. Look at the number of typos even within 140-character tweets. People just make mistakes. But hopefully those mistakes will be sporadic, few and far between, and that there will be some type of security controls and mitigating factors within the application that means those mistakes aren't as impactful to exposing user data. Or perhaps even the idea of DevOps and pushing left, meaning earlier and earlier in the development process, maybe some of those vulns are getting caught earlier on because we have linters or because we're, we're blacklisting certain functions that we know are misused. Or we're using code scanners or we're using dynamic scanners or we have QA environments now that we can do our testing on much more successfully. So this is what we're focusing on on a risk uh, metrics perspective or risk management to try to get down to that lower left-hand corner. So, coming up, trying to summarize, if we're diving into bounties, some of the things that I would try to say or emphasize as the future of what bounties should be is focus on that realistic threat model rather than just say you're missing X-frame options. Actually focus on how, what's the OAuth implementation look like here? What does the uh, workflow look like for password recovery? Is multi-factor auth always in, in, enabled? Uh, what about different things around payment structures, things like that? Um, one of the other things that I think is interesting are incentive models. So right now, from an application's perspective, it's really great that you're only paying for the vulnerability, you're paying for the risk that has been found. You're not actually paying for the effort to find that risk. On the other side of the coin, if you're that researcher, that means you're sort of paying a, uh, a um, roulette reel of vulnerability disclosure, meaning I found a vuln, I'm going to report it, and it took me X number of hours, and this X number of hours I can't charge as, as an hourly rate. It's either going to be based on whatever the impact that was. Maybe it'll be a $50 vuln, maybe the $1,000 vuln. Maybe I'm in that 5% cohort that's able to, to report a whole lot of findings and I can earn, uh, you know, this is my day job, reporting vulnerabilities. Or maybe you're at the far end of the spectrum and you're bumping up against a lot of duplicate reports. And the other thing I think is important to call out is that we're still in this mode of text, meaning here is what I found, here are the steps to reproduce it. And now somebody else has to go manually read it, manually reproduce as opposed to where did the scanners go? Why don't we have bounties or why aren't we paying more for bounties that submit a burp script or a zap script or something that we can drop into a code scanner or drop into a web app scanner? In other words, where's the automation so this bounty report can become a regression test? Or now this regression test can also be applied throughout the rest of the application to say here was one instance of the vuln, but maybe there's a couple dozen more. And the other thing that I wanted to just kind of plant the seed on 
is I have been focusing on the idea of crowdsourced security or crowdsourced vuln discovery from the idea of bug bounties or using bug bounty researchers as sort of a pen tester. But there's a lot of other ways you can engage them, public bounties or private bounties. That 5% or 17% um, of the participants that were contributing you know, at least that 80% of the vulns, those would be a great people to engage for a private bug bounty. And that private bug bounty may have a lot less noise. Rather than one third of the vulnerabilities being valid, maybe you can get up to two thirds or that 90% mark. And because you have a smaller group of people with a lot better skill, producing a lot higher quality reports. And then the other two things is that we don't necessarily need crowds just focused on vulnerability discovery. There's a lot of movement around threat intel sharing. In other words, everybody's network is being attacked, but they're being attacked in different ways. And I don't mean a, a, a Nmap scan is not an attack, a Metasploit you know, scan is not an attack, but phishing campaigns or very obvious exploits or command and control uh, traffic. These are the types of things that can be very interesting to share and important to share. As well as what would be really cool, building up fuzzing farms. So I've been talking a lot about web applications, but what about the huge amount of C and C++ code that we're building out there? All this open source code for our OS stacks. What if we were dumping them all into LLVM with address sanitizer turned on, undefined behavior sanitizer turned on, and we just watch and see what gets reported. And we start to say, oh, here's an error, let's go fix it. And start contributing some of those fixes. And the idea being that we'll at least get cleaner code, and most likely that cleaner code is also going to be more secure code, because some, some of those reports are very likely going to become exploitable types of reports. So with that in mind, I want to leave you with two thoughts as we sort of circle back to talking, I haven't completely forgotten about the good, the bad, the ugly, even though I haven't been referencing too much. But imagine, if you will, you wanted to engage, um, you know, for a few dollars more, you wanted to spend that on, uh, you know, increased payouts for bug bounties, or you wanted just to give your pen testers a fistful of dollars, different ways you can engage them. But in either way, the crowds can be different out there, and if you track the time you're spending on them, track how you're spending the money on them, you could find that crowd that's going to help. And the idea here of this was that if you think back to the American West, think back to Sergio Leone's movies, they're a lot about mythology. And there's a lot of mythology about the American West. And mythology is interesting because it gives us great stories, gives us ideas about the human condition. Some mythologies, however, are entertaining, but they're based on incorrect principles or, or bad data. So a little bit of here is the idea that mythologies can be nice, but let's collect data. Let's identify what's actually really going on with our vuln discovery, what's really going on with our risk models, with our, the risk of our applications, and figure out, are we spending that time and money wisely? And if not, what can we do to adjust? And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>